with me as I explore Scotland's powerful and inspiring We European neighbours. How are they able to do things differently? And what vision do they offer of a brighter future for Scotland? The Faroe Islands, 200 miles north of Scotland. With a population just 1% of ours on a cluster of 18 islands. But it's connected in all kinds of ways through language, technology, politics and infrastructure. Tunnels. <laughs> this, uh, this comes up on you very suddenly on the Faroes when you're driving. And it's a little unnerving, but it's the reason that these 18 islands are actually one nation. Um, there's about 20 tunnels I can count. There's two subsea tunnels. One of them's about five or six kilometers long. But it provides equality because if you can all access the high paid jobs in Torshaven, then it means that the wealth is spread equally around all the islands. And that's one of the main reasons that they actually embarked on this is fairness. So fairness and a connected nation. One of the first things that strikes you when you come to the Faroes is what you hear. It's not English, but it's not Danish. It's Faroese, spoken by just 66,000 people across the world. It's about the same size as Gaelic, far smaller than Scots. But when Google ignored their language, they prompted a feisty Faroese response. Faroese translate. Kuitanar means sheep testicles in Faroese. The problem is that Google Translate does not work with Faroese. One of the people behind the Faroese Translate campaign is Tor Verland Johansson, chief executive of Sansir Communications. It's a fact that every 14 days a language dies or goes silent in the world. It's very special that a small country like the Faroe Islands have their own language. It is what, what makes us we are so small that uh, the big companies like, for example, Google, they almost neglect us because Google have this translation service they call Google Translate, but it doesn't feature fairies. So instead of just saying, oh, we want it, we want it, we said, well, we will make it ourselves. We will help them with Faroe Islands Translate. Powered by Faroese volunteers. And this time we'll make it with live people, real people, Faroese people translating from every language in the whole world and press translate. And seconds later, they got a live translation on Faroese. Or simply learn how to say. <laughs> we are ready to translate for you at Faroe Islands. Uh, we are now working together to officially add uh, Faroese to Google Translate. We went up against Google once again. We didn't have Street View here on the Faroe Islands. So we made up this story about this young woman. She put camera on sheep uh, with solar panels so they could run for several hours. And then the sheep walked around and they filmed these wonderful islands. It works pretty good and the sheep doesn't really notice it. And this story go went viral. So suddenly they had this young girl asking Google to come and help her making Street View on the Faroe Islands. And so they did. Look, Google is coming. So now we are all covered with Google Street View. So it was a fantastic campaign for both the Faroe Islands and yeah, for everybody, actually also for Google. We are using technology like Skype, FaceTime, whatever. So it feels like that we are here. Technology, we really use it as, as a people to always be connected. The reason people in the back of beyond could make videos in seconds is the Faroes broadband. You're one of the, the smallest countries and you've actually got a massive achievement when it comes to broadband. What is that? We like to think that we have the uh, world's fastest mobile uh, broadband. 
and there's no uh, other operator that can deliver the speeds that we can. We have uh, mobile broadband uh, coverage uh, all over the islands, even the sea, uh, up to uh, 80 uh, miles uh, from the shore. How did this happen? How were you set up? We are government owned, uh, even though we are in comp competition. So, uh, so the, it's the support from the government that we are allowed to use all this uh, investment or do all these investments to get this full network. We have uh, uh, this very uh, good uh, partner, partnership agreement with uh, Huawei also, who is our hardware uh, supplier. And uh, we have always tried to give the same uh, experience, the same services to all population, even on the furthest island. The prices are the same and the services are the same everywhere on the islands. Our next step is 5G, obviously. 5G is almost equal to Internet of Things. You can uh, set up a device up on a mountaintop or wherever you are in a tunnel, and you don't have to do maintenance on it for maybe 10 or 15 years because the battery time is very low. So those are the technologies that we are implementing at the moment. Did you not doubt yourselves? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, uh, you, ha you have to try at least. You, you can just sit back and we want to connect with everyone. So the Faroes has the world's fastest mobile broadband, does it? With the help of the uh, Faroese lifeboat, we're heading out into the fjords to find out if that's really true. Well, we've left the capital Torshavn now. Uh, the lads are stepping on the power and we're heading out into the open sea. Well, there's a mountain between us and Torshavn now. We're an island out. Uh, it's quite bumpy, but Magni, who is the captain here, has got FaceTime uh, to his daughter in Copenhagen because we have 100 megabits where we're sitting right now. This is my daughter, she's pregnant. So on the 16th of June, I'll be a grandfather again. <laughs> Hello, Scotland. Other aspects of their media are pretty remarkable too. Well, that was a kind of bumpy ride. Um, back in the hotel now, just trying to chill a wee bit and discovering what's available. And there are three newspapers produced here in the Faroes. There are six radio stations, including one public radio station and even one TV channel that includes international reporting dedicated to the Faroes. That's pretty impressive for 50,000 people. The common factor in all these success stories is the Faroese parliament. The Faroes is a Danish territory, but has had home rule for 70 years. I'm here in the Logting, which is the parliament in the Faroes, it's a dinky but lovely traditional old building um, and it's got 33 MPs plus a set of ministers. More importantly, it has got a queen of powers. I'd say this is the world's most powerfully devolved parliament and I've come to speak to the Republican MP Björn Samuelsson about just what clout it wields. Björn, um, the powers that this Faroese parliament has are really quite extraordinary. Can you list what you're able to control here? Well, we are almost in charge of everything. We are in charge fully of taxing, of health care, of uh, education, um, every thinkable thing. Um, so there are some small things that are still under Danish power, but actually we are very, a very self-governing country. So this parliament has a very huge role in making laws every day and of course thinking of the well-being of the people in Faroe Islands. You didn't actually even mention energy and broadband, but you control them too. Yes, and of course we are quite proud of that and we are trying to cooperate with other countries and areas where they can use our expertise. And we have made a goal that we in 2030 will be 100% on renewable energy on ashore. And that's one of our biggest issues for the coming years. But let's talk money. 
Um, you are given some money from the Copenhagen government. Do they effectively subsidize these islands? I would say clearly no. The amount we get from Denmark every year is uh, not it's lesser than a decent football player is bought for today. You see, Faroe Islands might be tiny when it comes to population, but we are actually one of those large ocean nations. We are a very big country if you take our sea ter territory. And we are a very rich country if you take our resources. So we don't need the money from Denmark, is my point of view, and uh, hopefully we will very soon get uh, economical independence. But the deal seems to be that when you take on more responsibility and power from Copenhagen, obviously you have to finance that yourselves. Is that the way it works? Yes, that's the way it works and that's what we want. We want to say that when we are paying for ourselves, of course we are also deciding for ourselves. And that's why it has been so important to take responsibility for every thinkable area. If you want to decide, you have to pay. So the way devolution works here is that if you want to take a power to the pharaohs, you basically have to pay for it. I could put it another way. If you take healthcare, for example, we decide how much to tax in this country. So we also decide how to use the money. We use a lot of money to buy services from the Danes or, or we send patients to Iceland, for example. But we have the freedom to decide from whom we buy those services. And I think that's very important for us to have those possibilities to decide on our own. Now the other huge thing is that you have the right to sign international treaties and that's the reason that you are out of the EU whilst Denmark is in. Now how on earth does that work? Actually uh, when Denmark went into EU, Faroe Islands uh, uh, decided not to follow and we can design uh, international treaties for example on uh, fishery um, issues. That's a very long historical tradition that we do that. So we have always done that. The Faroe's people are running the Faroe Islands. But because we are still a part of another nation, we don't fix into any box. And that's make it often possible. I mean, we try to get member of EFTA and, and we try to get member of the Nordic Council and we try to get member of WTO. And they say, uh, yes, but what kind of country are you, actually? So that's why we are saying we are already so self-governing. Why shouldn't we take the final step? And the reason that you have that incredible power to be able to decide big things, like whether you join the EU and fishing treaties, is because of a vote way back in 1946. Can you tell us about that? In 1946, the people of the Faroe Island uh, voted for independence. Um, there was a majority of the people who said yes to independence, and this was, of course, connected to the Second World War, where we had been uh, totally cut the connection with Denmark because, because we were occupied by the British and the Danes were occupied by the Germans. So um, we did very well uh, on our own, so uh, the people said, OK, we, we will do just like Iceland, we will go out of uh, uh, the collision with Denmark and we will be a sovereign state. Uh, but um, it didn't go that way, so we got this home rule uh, law instead in 1948. And this home rule law gave us a lot of competence compared to what we had before 1948. It will still strike people as quite extraordinary that 50,000 people think they can be alone in the world on their own, not even in the EU. Do you get a sense of that from everyone else, how astonished they are at your almost bravery? I think that some people maybe think that uh, we are a bit naive, but I think quite the opposite. It's because we are thinking about the whole world is connected today. There's no such country as being one alone country. We just want the right to decide for ourselves with whom we make agreements. And, and so we say, when we are a sovereign country, we have the same possibilities as other countries. And we don't fall between two chairs as we often do today. So I think it's uh, quite logical, actually, if you know the story of this country. I, I don't think anyone in Faroe Islands, uh, or even in Denmark, think that Denmark and Faroe Islands is the same country. I mean, we never were, so 
So I've, to me, it's, it's quite natural and logical. Of course, some folk are more cautious about the future and think younger generations forget the Faroese economy is essentially dependent on just one thing. We have fish, fish, fish and fish. You have a polar bear. You didn't kill this yourself, did no, you? No, 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 no. <laughs> that is no. very, very, very important uh, to, to, to have fish, to eat fish. For 40 years ago, I think it was 20, 30 fillet uh, factory on, on the island here. Huh? Now we have three or four, 10,000 fishermen. Now we have um, 1,500. We are using uh, the machine to, 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 to produce the fish. They are uh, going out of the country to produce in Denmark. In Germany, we are not producing that in the Faroes. If we have problem, a problem with a bad year of mackerel, salmon, it has been the biggest problem in the Faroes, so we can think about. Because we have not anything to, 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 to fill it up with. We have to go back to the old days where we are a fishing nation and we have to live of the fish who are growing up around the island here. The, 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 the new fishing people are not thinking the same as my, because I am too old fashioned. Island life is traditional and includes the controversial practice of whaling. It's socially conservative too, until now. I spoke to some young students to find out what's changed. Actually, most of the young people, when they decide to study, most of them go to Copenhagen to study. And it kind of becomes like, then it's actually a bit more exotic to stay here, it seems, mm. uh, in a way. So, I love the Fire Islands, so uh, this is like my home. So when I leave, I feel like I always belong here. It isn't uh, hard to get into a place in the Faroe Islands where you have a voice and you can make a change. The question is, should I try to stay and make a change or should I just take the easy way out and leave? Being close to their parliament has helped these young women feel able to influence the shape of the future. And that's helped reverse population decline in stark contrast to islands around Scotland. Moving back to Faroe Islands is a bit hot or in at the moment. It's because of, primarily because we have a good economy at the moment. Um, but it also, I think, because we have made some mind changes during the last years. We have, uh, for example, put in place legislation on um, same-sex marriage. And we have also put emphasis on uh, education and other issues that is important. Yeah. That's why the, the bill made such a huge difference, because yeah. it, it opened us towards ourselves mm. too, yeah. and accepting ourselves. Mm -hmm. with, no, we're also talking about like the abortion law. We don't have free abortion in the Faroe Islands, and we keep fighting yeah. to have the society that we want. I think also as, I mean, I feel as a woman, I feel like it's also my, my duty in a way to fight for, mm. to making Faroe Islands a country where I want to live in and where my friends want to live and also the people who study abroad. Yeah. Like we want to make this a society where we want to stay. And I guess mm. also being small gives you good opportunity to do to yeah. do these yeah. things because- you Get your voice heard yeah. when yeah. you're just 50,000 people. That's the that's the, one of the best things about yeah. studying in the Faroe Islands and living here as a young, peop, young person is that we can make the society better and make, uh, make people want to be here. Erica Hayfield is a Scot who's married and made her life in the Faroes and she has an interesting insight into how things have changed. A few years ago, um, we kind of hit rock bottom because we were seeing depopulation for a number of years. And I think that we had a huge public debate, which really made us question, indeed, what are we doing on these rocks in the middle of the North Atlantic? The government started certain uh, initiatives, and one thing was investment in our university, cultural investment, presenting young people, who, young Faroese who are abroad, uh, with the opportunities that we have. And it seemed to be very much a collective effort in the Faroe Islands. We were determined that we were going to change things around. Over the past three years, 21% uh, of, on average, of the population growth stems actually from 
immigration from outside the Nordic countries. So that's contributing as well, and that's actually making the Faroes more diverse from having been unpopular or uncool or a place with no uh, opportunities. It seems to be a hip, a hip and trendy place. Uh, small places like the Faroe Islands, where people are highly interconnected, highly interdependent, and very intimate society, means it's very unhierarchical. And that's a good thing in many cases, sometimes not such a good thing. But it does mean that it's, uh, change comes quicker compared to a large, more bureaucratic society. New trade routes have also made the Faroes the hub of the Arctic, a confident international player able to host the massive Arctic Circle Conference. The uh, vision was to create uh, an international platform of dialogue and cooperation, which was in principle an open democratic forum where anybody could participate, whether you were representing governments of major powers or you were ministers or you were a global business leader or a major scientist, or whether you were a young student or an activist or an environmentalist, where we had the democratic platform, which was international in nature, but in principle open, because most of the big international conferences are closed entities. The sea passage is it's changing uh, quite rapidly. So it, in this case, in the Faroe Islands, we have a huge possibility. We're strategically uh, placed in the uh, Arctic Circle, and uh, we want to be uh, a part of it, and we want to contribute in a positive way. And this nation of just 50,000 people also has its very own airline and it's government owned. Atlantic Airways is a national carrier, it's owned by the government, and, but we are not subsidized. Uh, we are flying to different destinations and, and, and we are on a commercial base. And uh, last year we had almost 300,000 passengers to and from the Faroe Islands and we are looking forward to receive even more passengers this year and we are also looking forward to see more tourists in the Faroe Islands. But what is good about having an, a national carrier and a national airline is that we always consider first the wishes of our own people. Uh, and we are seeing that people are traveling more and our fairish people are traveling a lot. And it's very important for our country that people are traveling in order to get uh, new inspirations and to get a good network. And we also see that people can live in the Faroe Island and walk abroad. And that is only possible because you have a good infrastructure. As a nation, I think it's very, very important uh, that you have a vision, and if you think about Atlantic Airways, our vision is to connect the Faroe Islands to the world. Also presenting at the Arctic Forum is Faroe salmon producer Hidden Fjord, who've discovered the enduring value of quality, something Scotland may have to learn all over again if Brexit brings floods of cheap chlorinated imports. Very many of our customers around the world are telling us they think our salmon is the best. We have times back where the salmon prices were varying very much and we knew that the Scots were able to get better prices. But after the, as the times run by, the government and the Faroese uh, farmers found out that we needed to be only one farmer per fjord. The key advance was letting the fjords recover after each generation of fish. You could call it salmon set aside. The emphasis is quality, not quantity. So we followed the fjord. We put in place a regulation in 2003. So after that, you were not allowed to put fish in sea if there was fish there before. So you must have a period where there are no fish. Yeah, and then you go back to virginity, virginity you can say. Many costs will increase. But uh, the, the reward when you do that is that the, the biological motor will work much better. Naturally enough, folk at the Arctic Forum had some views about their biggest neighbour too. The North is definitely a territory for Scotland. Scotland is definitely a part of the North. To some extent it is right uh, that one of your leaders said a few years ago, maybe you have been too preoccupied with looking at London and discussing your relationship with London. Uh, we and the Far East have demonstrated how small communities 
in rather isolated territories can in fact enjoy a life of excellence in the 21st century economy. That the remoteness does not have to be a hindrance, whether it's in information technology or economic prosperity or many other areas. And that's important for Scotland because a big part of the Scottish population lives in those kind of conditions. And if you are mapping out an economic future for Scotland, you also have to give the people in the small communities and the remote parts of Scotland the same opportunities as if you are in the centre of Edinburgh. And here in the Faroe Islands, they have established on their own an internet telecommunication excellence that is twice the standard of Singapore, which is better than Korea. But the Faroe Islands, 50,000 people spread over these islands far out in the North Atlantic, have been able to surpass both Singapore and Korea by uh, participating in this uh, Arctic or Northern Cooperation, whatever you call it. Scotland can be inspired by seeing there are solutions uh, to some of the challenges that Scotland faces. And if there are some uh, economic hindrances, then you just deal with those economic political hindrances. Uh, and uh, if you go back 15, 20 years, most people would have said communities like Iceland and the Faroe Islands would be at a disadvantage in the technological economic evolution of the 21st century. But the fact of the matter is uh, we are now demonstrations of excellence. Uh, in many of uh, these uh, many of these areas and I believe myself and in many parts this is within the control of of the Scottish people. The Scottish people are very strong people and they have a lot of opportunity and, and I think also that uh, I see some similarities between Scotland and the Faroe Islands. If you for example take renewable energy, green energy, I mean you are very you have a lot of uh, possibilities there and you have a lot of competence. So I think that's one area of many where we could work much more together than we do today. And of course, also when it comes to a sustainable fishery, we should talk good together because we are both living off the sea. So I think we have a lot of common interests. So I hope, uh, I hope that we can get a closer connection to, Sc even closer connection to Scotland. I see Scotland as to England as what we are to Denmark. Uh, potentially we should be uh, independent, that's my opinion. And um, economically it should be a giant player in, in, in Europe in terms of you know, all the export and all the natural resources you have. So uh, it could be, you know, it's a, it's a country as every other country and uh, why not be totally and fully independent also economically. In the Faroe Islands we think that for example, Scotland has much more to offer than we have. I mean, you have so fantastic whiskey, you have fantastic nature, you have fantastic people, you're famous in all over, over the world, you are friendly people, and so on and so on. You have so much to build on. So when we think of you, we think of, well, what's the problem? The strength of any country is its people, obviously. Um, because if, if uh, natural resources will uh, fade away, you know, people will find other solutions, so it's always the strength of the people. The most important thing, I think, for Scottish people is to get the right to decide for themselves. So there's a lot to think about for the future of both our nations, the mighty pharaohs and our changing Scotland. Well, I've been here for four days now, and what really strikes you on the Faroes is the incredible confidence of these people. They've had the confidence as a tiny island to take on the might of Google, and they won. Uh, they've had the, the confidence to take on the salmon industries of far, far bigger countries and seem to do better than them. Uh, they even seem to forget that they've got things like the world's fastest mobile broadband because they've had it for so long, it's just in with the bricks. You have to remind them that they've actually got such powers that it makes them virtually a self-rule parliament. So they've got all of this here and it makes it slightly difficult to see as a Scot because it, it makes you realise that powers and confidence go together and because we haven't had them, we're doubtful. 
I think what this also shows you is that where there's powers, there's confidence, and there's a way for a far better future. If you'd like to see more films about our successful wee neighbours, please support our crowdfunder. Thank you.